that's happening, which means that it's it's all we go. We're, it's all happening. We're, we're on the move. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I'm gonna meet. Here he is. Until... It's Doctor David Turner. <laughs> oh, it's so. Oh, it's nice. It's nice to see you, David. It feels like it's been too long. Oh, it's been too long, my friend. I know. It's... I'm I'm struggling to shake the grin off my face, but um, you know, it's nice to see you. Hello, everyone Merry who's times. joining. We've got a. Uh, the, 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 the veritable masses are joining us. Um, right, while while that's happening, I'm going to click the... I'm going to do the highly professional uh, we are live right now quote tweet uh, because because that's what, you know, I need to do. Um, lovely. That's magic. We're, 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 we're live. We've got a picture of David and my face up. I'm using the new mic, uh, which is Can actually... Loud and clear. Is, is it loud and clear? Can everyone hear me nice and clearly? How's the mic? Is this clear? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, they're saying you're channeling Noel Fielding. That's high praise. Who, me? Mm, I think so, yeah. I presume so. Oh, it's just I haven't got my hair cut and can't be bothered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not channeling anything. A 70s rocker maybe a bit. But, yeah, a bit yeah. Of, yeah, a bit of prog rocker in there. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, who, which 70s rocker did you do you know drinks out of a Gaudi mug? <laughs> uh Brian Let's face it, it was probably Ryan. it was probably um, uh, Crimson King. If it was going to be any of the bands, it would have been Crimson King. Right, um, I'm going to open this. Oh, I've, I've, I've got, I'm used to my Lavalier mic, but it's not going to be a thing. So I'm drinking. I'm going to drink a small can of of uh, Dead Pony Club because it's Dead quite Pony. a pleasant session. Well, under um, here, I'm wearing an Ants Back and Hop Day T-shirt, but oh, that's what I have to do with this. Are mm -hmm. you going to Superman it out just at the end of the show as part of the advertising bit? Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Um, Everybody will be scared at that point and run away. That's true. So let's bring back what on earth we're talking about. Let's do it. So there's our two little faces, and we've got we're going to talk about quails on rails. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a. Uh, so we all need a break from the from talking about current events. So mm -hmm. we're going to think about. Um, uh, we're going to think about uh, actually a really interesting little project. Well, not little project at all. A, a really interesting, highly involved uh, research project that that Dr. David. Spiral I went down. I yeah. say. <laughs> this is. It feels like a lot of your pro really that, that your your history projects do this. That you end up on a tremendous spiral, which is fine. That's kind of the point, isn't it? That's how it well, works. Well, I will say this: I have too many projects, and I need to focus down. So you know. <laughs> Yes, it's and uh, publish some of this research, damn it, David. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You just need like a buzzer in the corner of the room going publish, publish. Yeah. Um, no, you don't. God, academics do not need that. That's the last thing any academics need. That's exactly no, what real life is like. Real life for academics is that stupid buzzer. Um, <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, remember if you're in the chat, at me and I shall ask questions. Um, uh, yes, good. Uh, just in case, so for all the moderators who didn't realise they were moderators and are now moderators, um, the rules are, there are no rules, just if people are, are being spammy and not very nice, which to be fair is basically zero people ever in the Real Matter chat. We have a lovely chat, but just in case it does happen, um, do, do your do your worst, but but play nice. Um, right, so, uh, oh, you know what, let's, 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 let's do the intro, let's kick off the intro and then we can get cracking. Ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, and uh, everyone, in fact, not just ladies and gentlemen, but everyone, uh, welcome to Rail Matter. City 225. I always get nervous when I press that because I'm always slightly afraid that um, always slightly afraid that I'm going to have forgotten to update it properly. But no, no, there we are. Episode 28, Quails on Rails with Dr. David Turner. Um, yeah. So huh? uh, we're going to... The first thing we do always these days is we have the news. Um, so today's news is... Uh, and feel free to chip in if you have, a, if you have, have some thoughts on the news. Um... Dr. DT, uh, it, the news is, firstly, franchising is dead, long live franchising. Um, this, it's interesting because this is a slide I put in like one of the earliest rail matters um, because franchising had, I, I basically predicted that franchising would die and it would never come back. And that prediction has come true because the government has, has announced that it's the end of franchising. Apart from the strange legal loophole, which is the fact that even though they're going to be concessions, 
um, they are still actually legally franchises because they haven't changed the, the legislation yet. But the, the, they are franchises in name only. Um, currently, they're like a weird emergency situation where the government is paying c- companies 1.5% over the top of their operating costs as profit. Um, that's it. That's all they get. Uh, and then they run the service. But that's going to basically be the, the model going forwards. So, yeah, a, a lot of people were like, can you explain this, please? Uh, and so I'm, I'm hopefully explaining it now fairly succinctly because obviously it's not a dedicated chat uh, rail matter for this yet. Well, you see, you see, I, 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 I haven't, I've been one week till term. I haven't really been, I've heard it happen, but uh, mm-hmm. thank you for explaining it to me. I mean, I, yeah. Yeah. It's quite, you, I mean, it's quite... mean, franchising was dying before, wasn't it? it? it, it so was, it, this, yeah. it, this is, this is a trend in, in transport history. Something big happens and it accelerates pre-existing processes. Mm, yeah, you yeah. Know, merger was being talked about before 1923, and it, yeah, so it, it's typical railway history, I yeah. think. And it, it happens with echo, it, echoes, I think. Yeah, it's happened with a bit of a whimper rather than a big bang, which is sort of what, which perhaps is a little different to previous situations, but um, but it's very much like, as you say, the the writing's been on the wall for the fran- for franchises for a long time before COVID. Um, and, and you know, so um, so yeah, this is really just an inevitable. I think what's happened is that reality has cornered government into having to make a particular decision, because they were kind of arming and eyeing over the Williams review, which was basically suggesting what's happening now anyway. But COVID has somewhat um, pressed them into the corner because nothing's making any money because only forty yeah, percent of people reality. are driving on trains. Blooming reality. Well, this is it. So that's franchising is dead. Long live franchising. The next mm-hmm. news item. Ah, yeah, this is important. So, um, okay, firstly, working from home is bad, actually. Well, not everyone thinks this. Actually, 50% of people who work from home love working from home, and that's great. That's a good thing. However, 30% of people hate working from home, and we mustn't forget those working from home people um, because that's a pretty sizable chunk of people who are really struggling with the working from home thing. Um, yeah. So I did this poll, uh, and it's not particularly scientific, I had, I'll freely admit, but I got I got nearly three thousand sort of uh, sample size, which is not too bad. And it did that thing where the numbers, the kind of the percentages, basically stabilised after about five hundred votes. So of my Twitter fo- reach, um, this is fairly representative, which is nice. Um, so this, yeah, this was interesting. The reason it's interesting is because um, a lot of people are talking about working from home being a new normal, and, and and in those discussions, I think there's a lot of people forgetting the. The fact that there's a lot of privilege that allows people to work from home comfortably. Mm-hmm. A lot of, of, of people, you know, young people, um, in some cases people with families who don't, who, who, who struggle to concentrate when they've got families. Lots of people with lots of different situations, huge plethora of different situations, aren't coping with working from home very well. Um, and I count myself among them. Um, so it's important to think about that. And, and, I, and, think, I, th- I think for me, one of the, the factors is, it it would have been so I I get this sort of a resonance with with the move to online that a lot of universities doing and there was a lot of people perhaps complaining at the start that it doesn't really work. I've been teaching online for six years. I've been working from home for seven now. Before that, a PhD mm. for part of my time. And something that I think is is the case is that like the courses, actually there was we develop a distinct way of doing it with the programs online, it's not simply just transferring things online. It's an exceedingly laborious process. And I think people are not set up for working for home on top of that. So if you had a sort of dedicated office in your house, if you had support from workplaces with regards to laptops, phones, equipment, and you had regular good management, but we're not just not set up for it yet. Exactly. Yeah. And and a lot of people, I think the range of circumstances is substantial that that people, um, there are people kind of uh, working, living and working under. Um, oh, I just got really loud on the mic. Is anyone getting some strange feedback in the chat? Let me know. I'm still getting used to the new microphone, everyone. Oh, that's a good point. No, in fact, I'm going to finish what I'm doing now, and then after the news, I'll do the microphone test. Right, okay. So the next slide on the working from home is bad, actually, news item. is, is this interesting thing that um, John Bull uh, posted this morning, which was interesting, uh, as I just said twice, uh, is about the fact that we're, at, uh, we're back above 60%. Um, of people working from uh, working, um, you know, traveling to work, not working from mm-hmm. home again. Um, so that shows that yeah. So basically, my my before lockdown, the number of people who re- work regularly from home was about five percent. Um, so even that doubling leaves ten percent, 
it's still not that many people. So we're already at 20% and, and there's no sign of that slowing yet. Although obviously we're about to go into a potential second lockdown, which will throw all the numbers again. So who knows? But the point is that it's not everyone working, for, everyone works from, working from home now is not, is neither true nor a nice situation. So um, yeah, there we are. That's my observations all. Uh, next news item related to that actually is about transport usage stats. Um so, yeah, so the, the, I've just updated these and posted them um, on Permanent Rail uh, Twitter account. You can see that cycling has got a bit of a, a rise again. Ignore that last big spike. That's a bit of an eccentricity in the um, in the rolling average figures. But you can see road is, is trundling along around about 100%. Um, bus services continue to climb pretty steadily, actually. Fair play to buses. Rail services, I mean, it's a bit of a bitty climb, but it is nevertheless still a climb. So we're between 40 and 45% of rail usage now so it's steadily climbing it's slower than i'd originally uh, well not expected it's slower than it than the kind of um when when things were more stable between sort of july and uh, and august there was quite a steady climb um and that's obviously slowed quite a bit and it's been interrupted by kind of holidays and resumption of working and changes in policy uh, and and in lockdown rules as well so yeah i continue to i'll keep updating that while the data c comes out because i think it's interesting um yeah, any thoughts on that trend there, David? Well, I, I, I think, I think it's it's just what what we've been saying. I mean, I'm I'm gratified by the cycling rising up again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's nice to see. I wonder how, uh, for example, there's been a bit of a backlash against sort of closed streets, especially around here. You know, uh, west West London, East London, yeah. and I wonder how much. You know, once the sort of other forms of transport, um, you know, sort of get gets into the flow, how much that will fall, and you know, the, that backlash might have an impact. But I wonder also, and I'd be interested in what you think. How many actually people who were going by train are now going by bike? Because owning a bike is is you know a bike that can cope with long journeys might also be you know that you need the income to do do that. You know, to have a good bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if there's any displacement there. But I mean, it's gratifying to see the rail service going up, but it hasn't recovered as well as everything else. Or yeah, know. it's it's interesting. Um, it is interesting to um to, to see that sort of different the different rise. Yeah, I, I agree with the bike the, the bike thing actually. It's a, it's, a, it's a good point. I think that um, yeah, people are generally better off for ones who, well. In, in London, I think you'll find that people, on average, the people who are cycle commuting are ones who are better off. Bus commuters are generally the ones who are slightly more representative of the of the general, yeah. you know, the general population. I think. Anyway, interesting. And also, interesting. there's perceptual things about cycling. There's some very, very interesting studies that, you know, for a lot of people, um, cycling is perceived as, you know, if you could go by car, why would you cycle? You have to get over a sort of cultural emotional hump there. So there's lots of people who probably wouldn't even consider cycling. So, yeah. So yeah. I don't know how that's relevant, but it's it, it you know. Well, it just it, it just adds into the pile. It's just interesting to look at these observations and sort of. I think the most important thing is to just be pensive and thoughtful about what the numbers mean and, and not jump to any conclusions, but also not, you know, in both directions. There are some people who are kind of painting kind of uh, doom and gloom, mm. and the reality is that rail numbers are still sort of gently climbing. So there's no sign of that doom and gloom actually playing out at this point equally they're climbing pretty slowly and it's obviously still a major impact on the on the function of the railway system so um yeah next news item oh it's a slightly cheerier thing so on Yay. friday was the new tracks in the history of railways conference it was well, it thursday was, and friday it was th sorry it was thursday and friday yeah wow yeah um i'm, I'm was, very glad you included this gareth because it, it was really uh a fun interesting i mean it was it was a great couple of days. Um, so, my colleagues, uh, Mike Esposter, Sophie Bora, Erin Beeston, and, and Ollie Betts arranged this uh, Twitter conference. So we we did have one. Me and Ollie have one in the works, uh, but of course that that was cancelled. So we decided to take it onto Twitter. Mm. And it's um it was tremendous. There was all sorts of a huge range of different topics, lots of pictures, lots of really interesting pictures of this, of which this is one. Um, thanks to um the person I nabbed this off. I hope they don't mind, but it's a really nice, high quality, 
um, reproduction of a print showing Immingham Dock if you can't read the text in there. It's, it's just really good. So you can find all that. It's all there still for everyone to see, which is really nice. That's what's so nice about this format. I think it's it's it's, it's nice because it's accessible. Because actually, it's, it's what was it, 15, 20 tweets a thread maybe about that sort 15. of thing? 15. We had a maximum of 15. Yeah, so, so a really nice bite-sized chunk. But actually, you can fit quite a lot of information into 15 tweets. Plus, there's loads of nice pictures. And, and actually following all the th- tweet th- tweet threads lots of interesting discussion as well so i i, I really enjoyed it i think it's brilliant um so everyone can go and find that the hashtag is well so priyanka in the uh in the chat has actually ah. just posted the hashtag hello priyanka she's one of our speakers um oh. and we hear from her that the they're actually planning uh, another one uh in 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 I think it's to do with heritage in India. Um, oh, Priyanka fantastic. might clarify that one. Yeah, me. yeah. But it's inspired other that. things going on, so that's good. It was brilliant, uh, and 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 I'm still, I'm actually still picking through some of the threads because I, I kind of went for some of the ones that really jumped out, but I've been going back through and picking through. They're just really interesting. Some really good yeah. stuff in there. Um, thanks for joining. Hello, Priyanka. Thanks for joining. Um, uh, David Shepherd asks if this is the Victorian version of City Skylines. It does look a bit like that, doesn't it? Um, I would love a Victorian version of City Skylines. When's that mod? That would be epic. That would be amazing. Uh, right, let's. There's there's lots of good chat about working patterns as well. There's good good stuff in in the chat. There are some really interesting observations from about people who are enjoying working from home, um, and and others who who are struggling with it. Yeah, some lots of really good stuff in there. Right. Quails. <laughs> quail. Team. Quail. It's quail time. Right. Before we do quail time, I'm going to do a quick test. Everyone who is on the chat. I've currently got my mic on top of my desk, but with a foam slice to stop it being vibrated by my computer. So can you tell the difference between what I'm saying just now and what I'm what I'm now saying? Have you noticed any difference in the chat? Uh, tell us if there's any difference to my sound. David, you, have you heard a difference? Can you help hear a difference at no, all? No, no, it, so- it sounds good to me, man. Yeah, I don't think I've noticed a difference. I might be able to get away without having foam, basically. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. Right, perfect. Okay, uh, if people are upset, uh, let me know in the chat. Anyway, quails. So, quails. Uh, Dr. Yeah. David Turner, why... So I'm going to put this slide up. Tell us about what, why on earth did quails become a thing that you now know a huge amount about? More than I ever thought in my life I would <laughs> yeah. know about. So I'm, I'm a researcher in uh, railway history, transport history, and as people know from if they've if you haven't yet, go back and look at my piece on, you know, the piece Gareth and I did with beer. Oh, yes, do I am interested in many different things. I'm researching uh, marketing, uh, supply chains, and other things as well. And, and I got interested. So I, I teach a MA in railway studies, a three-year MA. The students are starting next week, so hello to any of my students who are, are watching. Hello to some of my new students and my old students, and whatever. But I teach that, but I'm I'm more towards moving towards supply chains and different transport multimodal because I actually think supply chains are a very good way of exploring both the Victorian economy, things like demand. The supply chain connects so much when you mm. think about it. It connects consumption. It connects transport. It connects um, things like hygiene and health. It connects uh, environment, as we'll see. And, well, Gareth, the next photo, I, oh, I think, yeah, explains it. Uh, everyone can hear me put my beer on the table, which is nice. Oh, yeah, good stuff. This picture is great. So, yeah. This is a picture that was published, and we're all right for copyright because, you know, we're commenting on it. Uh, Yeah. yeah. This was a picture that was published in Railway Magazine and I think about 1913, and it it, it turns up in other books as well, so I don't think it was the Railway Magazine anyway. But I looked at this and I thought, well, this is, what is going on here? Uh, So this was a series of two photographs. One was to do with milk. And this is quails being unloaded at King's Cross Depot in like 1912, 13, 14. Hmm. And I was just like, quails. I do not know anything about quails. (laughs) I have no idea they were bought by rail. I have no idea where they come from, where they went. So, of course, I'm big on the 19th century newspapers online. And I thought, I'm big on it, but, you know, I'm very keen to use it. So I, I did a bit of searching. And suddenly this... Flower bloomed into the well. A better phrase, a better term, is a crazy drain of 
history because I start at the top and I went down and down and down <laughs> in this, you know drain deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until the point where I've got hopefully we're gonna I'm gonna have something published with my colleague Thomas Spain who also works on supply chains we're gonna have something published either late this year or early next year on supply chains and governance so that's how I came to quails because I think actually the looking at a discrete supply chain a sort of very self-contained supply chain doesn't have a to say a manufacturing process in it it's not like beer where you have four ingredients and they have to be processed into quail into quail into beer mm. quail is a singular supply chain that you can actually follow and look at and change how it got shaped and twisted and turned over the decades so it, it just it just became something I thought, oh, that's interesting. And here we are, talking about quail. Indeed. I mean, I'm getting weird. I'm, good. I, I'm getting used to having the earphones in my head with this new mic because it, it like makes my voice a lot louder. I got a bit of a weird bubble of feedback there. Sorry, yeah. everyone. I, I'm getting used to the new tech. I mean, it's snazzier and should be providing better quality. But anyway, yeah, this picture is great. So, so yeah, the range that, that you're looking at, just, just to kind of confirm. So it's between, um, oh, if I press the correct buttons... Uh, between 1814 and 1914, which in history terms is actually a tremendously long period. So, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, I think, I mean, the earlier periods I don't know much so much about because it, it's, it's quite hard when you've got these obscure trades to, to really find everything you want. Uh, I'm, I'm picking up from scraps. My research is scraps. So you'll find a line here, a small article there. There's not, there's one, one, file in the National Archives on this uh, that doesn't actually tell you a great deal. Files in the National Archives tend to be a lot of repeating and carbon copies and early versions of documents on occasion. So it is a, a very scrappy project in some sense, but I think I've kind of moulded it into something that really tells an interesting story that connects with environmentalism, consumption, transport being a key dimension. Yeah, definitely. So... Um right so so this slide is yeah so this so this this I, i've i've bubble pictureified but tell us about this so so what what, what are these picture bubbles representing david what, what yeah so we, we've touched on a, a few things um and these are sort of the main themes the first one on the left is well what, what is that picture there gareth this is so this this here is a picture of the one i'm drawing an arrow against now um, is a picture of a restaurant. I was I was trying to get one of the old Ritz, but it, it didn't quite work. So yeah. this is an original restaurant kitchen around about the period of, uh, of which we're talking about. I think this one's yeah. actually in New York, but they're all okay. pretty well, clean. They ate yeah. quail as well. Um, so the first sort of area we're looking at is market demand and how how that sort of increased over time and how market demand can influence the nature, shape, pattern and development of supply chains. So that that's our sort of first first sort of theme, yeah, yeah, point of frame of reference if you like. First theme. So the, the next second, thing, this one oh, is the first steam locomotive in Austria. Again, don't know why I picked that one. Cuz it, it looked like a nice picture that I could theft uh off of uh, off of Wikimedia, but it's also yeah, quite an interesting visual. The locomotive is actually called Austria as well. It so, is, yeah, look at yeah. that, Austria. Yeah, nice. So the 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 second theme is how transport technology, speeding up transport communications, facilitated goods mobility and the development of this trade. Hmm. The uh, this one, yeah. What's going on here? Well, we all know where this horrible place is. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, um, a, a high class bar. In <laughs> yeah, that's it. Um, hopefully, it's, it, hopefully it will be at some point. That's what I'm hoping. Re remove the move the whole thing up to Birmingham. That's what I say. Anyway, this is the House <laughs> of Commons. But actually, this is really an allegory for all state. This is, kind of yeah, this, uh, this is connecting for a lot. This is that state actors, um, whether especially, I mean, state actors play a role in all supply chains. At some, whether that be regulation, but especially in this one, we've got. Um, the quail trade, we, we will talk about invasions, we will talk about um, prohibitive restrictions of movement of the goods, um, and we will talk about, um, well, if we get that far, the Metropolitan Police in Bermondsey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, that's a bit after the period we're talking about, but it's, a, it's a, maybe something to save to the end. Yeah, so... Um... Uh, is that sound balance all right, everyone? I've got a few people in the chat just checking on sound balance. So this one here, this one's a bit more obvious. This is just a, 
a, a, a kind of a fairly big uh, generic snip, snippy snip of, um, yeah. of Google Maps so, for the distance. So yeah, distance between supply and demand causes problems. So the, the, the moment you start lengthening a supply chain, especially with a perishable good or live good in this case, it will cause you problems that need to be overcome. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that. And then the last one here is this this thing here, which is some trees. Actually, it's some rainforesty trees, but really it's just me putting a picture in for nature, I think. Yeah, and I think I think my final theme is that nature is an ever, especially in food, nature is a sort of ever-present force that we, we try and overcome. We try and shape, but it is always there. And we'll talk about uh, how, how that is so. Um, but to give you a non quail example milk will go sour mm. so we try and control the bacteria that does that or we try and processes that stop it replicating and stuff like that so in any supply chain you're uh, the involving a food good you're trying to control nature but also in you know nature shapes where you farm and you know stuff like that so we'll talk a bit about that too yeah definitely so um uh uh let's Sorry, I'm looking at there's still lots of chat about sound levels. Um, people are upset about my mic choices. That's fine. Oh, we have to be quiet. Oh. Ah. Did everyone hear that? That's the sound of a quail. Put, type in the chat if you heard the, the quail sound. There we are, a nice picture of a quail and had audio. This is how high tech we're getting in rail natter. I've started so introducing was, sound effects. There was a, a description of the quail sound and it was called um, Wet My Lips. It was just like, uh, yeah, Ooh. if it's on a play, I'll go for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, st sounds smacking into each other. Um, yeah. uh, rock smacking into each other gives, this, gives that sort of approximate sound. Um, yeah, so... I oh, see, now I'm too loud. So I'm... I, it's fine, everyone. It's fine. Sound levels. Everything is fine. This is an entirely professional production, particularly for those <laughs> on audio only who are just hearing like the sound levels sort of rocketing and dropping. Yeah, we got some people hearing the quail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Uh, people heard the, 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 the heard the, the quail sound. I'm pleased by that. So, um, talking of the quail, uh, the common so, quail. Uh, oh, what's his what's his Latin name? Can anyone on the chat go for the Latin name? Oh, go, go, what 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 what. Any, any, any? Can you remember the Latin name of the? I, I, I cannot. Cottonix, Cottonix. Cottonix, Cottonix. Common, common European quail, yeah. and, and this is a, a. I mean, you put a map up there, and this sort of goes to the heart of, um, what, what shape a major shaper of the supply chain and the nature of it, and we don't really get on there the sort of, uh, the migrationary patterns, but the. But I think this is more modern. I think I think it. I'm not sure, but yeah, it, it would, definitely is. So it's possibly slightly different to the to the yeah, patterns that we've but, seen at the, in the period we're talking. Yeah, about. you've got resident and breeding areas, um, non-breeding areas. But w what essentially happens is the bird migrates or it migrated um, from the north of Europe in about I think it was about April May time. Uh, went south for the winter and then returned uh, later in the year. Uh, those two periods of uh, when when it sort of passed over the Mediterranean is the the great sort of quail catching season. It would land um, in uh, and around Europe all the way from southern Spain right through to um, right through to you know sort of Turkey that way. Um, and then it and then it would you know it would be caught in huge numbers and this is not something that started in the 19th century by any means it started in uh well as far as you know there is a story in the bible apparently of huge amounts of quail landing and the victorians love to mention this about landing on ships and sinking the ships oh my goodness right I mean, we're talking millions and millions and millions of quail and then Actually, we were in, uh, my wife and I were in Sicily uh, last year for holidays, and uh, we actually f went up to uh, a place, uh, The lo we went up to the town of Cairo, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and we, were talk we got talking to one of the archivists, because we went to the archive, we just stumbled mm -hmm. across it, and he was saying that, I, I think Syracuse's name is derived somehow from the word quail, because there was a famine in 
or a drought in Sicily, and the quail saved them because they came at the right time. That's amazing. So, so the quail is part of not just the food culture of the Mediterranean area; it's part of the the broader social, you know, it, it, broader culture. It's a mm. part of it uh, around the Mediterranean. But by the 90s, mid 19th century, yeah, you've got plenty of quail uh, being caught in the med. Yeah. So, so um. And here is a picture of said quails being nabbed, I think. Yeah, so they had these massive nets that were up around up around the uh, Mediterranean. And I think, Gareth, you, you've got the quote, haven't these you? Things, yeah, these are the nets here. You can see yeah. the nets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, so, I've got the quote. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll flip forward to the quote and I'll go back. So this is a quote that's from the bottom of this picture you can see, everyone. I'm going to read this out. I'm going to read it out in my best, in my best Victorian voice, isn't it? <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I should do a David Attenborough in a minute. Uh, anyway, blinded decoy quail are placed in a large cage, often as many as 60 or 70 together, and the cage is placed on a platform elevated by poles about seven or eight feet from the ground in the centre of the netted part. These decoys call, making a noise like a man knocking two stones together, and the quails in passage hear it and are attracted to the spot. Yeah, I can't remember which way. Well, good, good reading there, Gareth. Thank you. Top stuff. Um, I can't remember which way round it was, but uh, in terms of, uh, I think it was the male quail that arrived first, and they were the ones that were blinded, and then they attracted the female quails. Grief. Yeah. Um, but you know, you get scenes around this, uh, like this, all around the Mediterranean, um, and I'm just looking at my notes here. But you, you get, you know, in 1850s, in one year, they might take uh, about 150,000 quail. Oh, good grief. So this yeah, person here is absolutely laying into the quails. You can see there's just yeah. a scattered debris of quails that that person has obliterated. It's nice. You would you would walk around the bazaars and the, the markets and, um, you know, you'd, you'd find them on sale at quite cheap prices. So yeah. but it, 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 was quite a, it was quite a harvest, you know. It was a, a large amount of food that, that was flying towards you. So Yeah, I mean... Yeah. I suppose it, this is this is like on a level of industrial industrial food collection. It looks more like fishing than uh, than poultry yeah, farming at this point, right? Absolutely, it's it's epic. So, um, oh yeah, I forgot. There's the the R.I.P. I put a little R.I.P. coffin there for the for the quails because yeah, let's face it. At this point, there's like a missing paragraph here, which is at which point we obliterate and bash the quails until their life ekes from their tiny little foul bodies. But but I think I think a, a point here that, that should be sort of stressed is that there was no sh in the 1850s any bodies in the 1850s they're not thinking there's a shortage of supply these this isn't denting the population you know at that point especially given some of the most of the consumption was local you get local quail as well who live there all the year round so in the 1840s and 50s there's a sense that yeah well you know there's a lot of quail <laughs> yeah so. Yeah, um, kind of like fishing stocks now. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah, so there we go. So, oh, and there's another nice picture of some quails. There. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, you know, hello, quails. These ones have all been caught and are about to be consumed. No, I, I have no idea. That's just a nice picture of some quails. Um, ah, right, okay. So talking of which, so we're converting these lovely quails into this lovely dish. Um, yeah. So, us, yeah so, so tell us about this. This is actually two separate things, I think, here. Yeah, so on the right, we've got an, to, to keep the train theme um uh, on the on the left this is the london northwestern railway uh menu first class menu i think from 1905 and it's got aspect of quail on the right this is from mrs beaton so and, and, and as the point i'm making here is demand from about the 1840s in britain demand is on the rise mm -hmm. and it's an, very much an elite food um, in the sort of mid century it's it's, it's re eaten by the rich the wealthy uh, it's not common it's not found in Britain very much people would shoot them in Britain when they were, were in Britain and, and we'll talk about how that changes because there were lots of you know quails could be shot quite easily in, in the mid century I get the sense and as I say so I'm picking this up from bits so you know these might change but some of this might change but by the late 19th century and into the Edwardian period, it's turning up in Mrs. Beaton. So Mrs. Beaton, uh, for those 
be as you don't know was a, a, a cookbook for um, for the for the household, and it was purchased by you know middle class uh, people, and this is an image of a recipe that involves quail. So you get that distinct shift from something that's being sold in the elite butchers of Edinburgh to being sold en masse, um, you know, in, in you know, London. In, yeah, uh, in, in, in the in the f- food markets and the flesh markets in London, yeah. Exactly. Um, aspic of quails. What the heck is aspic of quails? So I think it's, it's a jelly. You put it in a jelly. Ah, okay. I see. I think. I think. Right. So, yeah. But um, it, it it's it's a commonly it's it's a it's a eaten thing around and uh, you know so this is a, a fundamental change to the nature of the market in London and as we'll see that affects the supply chain transport arrangement etc 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 so yeah, yeah 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 so um right let's whiz ah right okay so here so so the, yeah so this is the point you're making is that um you know demand is climbing. Which yeah. I think then uh, has the knock-on effect that supply yeah. drops, right? Yeah. So I mean, or are they unrelated? I, is it the fact that actually simil- so demand starts climbing, and then supply is dropping? Is it as a result of the fact that that demand has been quashed, or is there actually other other yeah, factors? So, at play? so they are linked. They are very. They, they are. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. Uh, they are linked, um, and we'll get to what links them, which is the transport on the chain, um, in a minute. But you get a situation like in Capri in and Sicily, um, you get uh, a fall off from about, as I said, in the 1850s, 150,000. By 1904, it's catching 30,000. Okay, uh, that's a huge yeah. drop. In Britain, the native uh, quail uh, changing agricultural processes. Uh, quails like to live in sort of scrubland and sort of, you know, wild heads rose but you know the changing agricultural processes in britain um shift uh, so you don't find quail uh, very much in england you know anymore so you know across europe there is a real palpable sense and there's an international conference congress in i think the early Edwardian period uh to do with game game you know that involves Different countries all around, you know, Europe saying quail is quail is suffering. Quail is going, you know, from the number core, um, and that that is a symptom of growing demand uh, in London and uh, sorry, Britain. Britain is the biggest consumer of quail aside from local um, really? local consumption. Good, it is most of the quail. So to give you a, a, an impression of the size of the demand. Um, in about 1840, um, you get sort of a. So let me just get the stats up here. Yeah, yeah go for it. Yeah. In 1854, 1,000, uh, sorry, one, 17,000 birds were shipped to London in one batch, right? 17,000 in just one batch. One batch. Good okay. Grief. So, okay, rising demand and imports. And in, you know, 1880, 70,000 batch is landed at Marseille that would go trained to London via the channel. 1909, deliveries of about 100,000 were reported in one batch. Good. Well, so the already that's trade, 100,000. Good. Crikey. The overall trade in 1869, 200,000 quail were sent to London in the year. By 1897, Egypt exported 2 million birds to Britain alone. And that's not on top of some remaining supply that came from Southern Europe. So we go from a situation where there's so that there's this explosion of demand mm. and that affects uh, quail numbers. But as we'll see, it also affects supply chains. Yeah, crikey. I'm going to brief interlude just to let everyone know uh, or to any, any of our listeners who are listening to this after the fact. Um, currently in the chat, we have possibly 20 different quail based puns uh so uh discussing this this disaster of quail uh demolition so we've got over quailing uh you know dominic quailing uh mm-hmm. yeah, we've got uh common quail policy cross quail chris quailing i'm loving it all yeah so there's I'm so um, up the puns they're quality 
Yeah, <laughs> here he is. British Quailways. Yeah, it's just relentless. Yeah, this is quite something. Uh, it'll spoil the net. Yeah, please do British Quail in Rail Alphabet 2, is uh, what Richard uh, Smith is asking me. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, as ever, the chat brings us all joy. Uh, <laughs> right, anyway. So, yeah, so... Okay, so I, I think I can see where this... So, so perhaps previously... Um, it, it, before you had uh, mechanization of transport, um, there wouldn't perhaps have been as direct a connection between supply and demand, or at least it would have been more locally driven, right? I, th I think you do get that sort of sense. Um, coil could be shot in Britain many times of the year um, in the British Isles. Um, and it's a, you know, it, it's not, I mean, it's an elite food, but you know you don't get that sort. Of, and I, and I, I mean, I don't really have an answer why um, consumption grew. You know, I think it's maybe aspirational. Maybe it's it becomes common. You know, it becomes like a, a regular food stuff. So, but but definitely before this period and the improvements in transport that allow and facilitate that trade, especially to, to reduce the cost of transport. Yeah, I was going to say the cost of uh, the cost for the consumer, presumably, is driven by supply to an extent so so it, yeah. it, it's almost self-fulfilling as 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 you had a few more people buying it the costs started coming down as prospective yeah. presumably you'll have prospective uh, merchants bringing a lot in with a lower price with the intention yeah, and, of pushing it and then that cycle and transport that. links as well transport links and speed and we'll talk a bit yeah so that. so the next so the next slide is um ah right okay so two maps on the screen so, so us, yeah so what's going on here i'll, I'll draw first... some arrows yeah, the first one is uh, from uh, I think that's sort of eighteen forties fifties. Um, let me just get where my numbers are. So yeah, so you know we've got we got a situation where actually a lot of quail was sourced from northern Europe. Um, they were shipped. We've got reports of them coming across on the southeastern railways liners into London. They didn't travel far. The transport requirements were not great. The number of inter interfaces across that mm. um, was small. You might get uh, sort of a, a capturer, a merchant, a import merchant, maybe a, a broker, but I'm not sure. I haven't really. I will confess not to be totally au okay fait with the, the the structure of whether there's a factor involved as well. Somebody would extend credit and whatnot. But fundamentally, the number of interfaces is small. So that that's the 1840s, 50s. Move forward, and, and I think that's that's more towards the 1880s. Um, it's longer, so what you can see there is um, uh, a lot of quail uh, came from Messina, which is just uh, just where Sicily meets the, the mainland of Italy. They would be shipped up to Marseille, go across um, France, and then they would reach the Channel and cross. Uh, there might be other routes. Those are the only ones I've found. As you can see, there are some very thin lines. I've, I've got some accounts of quail coming from Egypt. Egypt, you know, British interests in Egypt start rising before the 1880s, um, and there's small supplies of quail coming from that part of Europe, but generally the bulk is coming from the south of Italy. So that's that's about sort of the measure of it when about 200,000 birds were coming in. Crikey! So so actually, I see, I see a little thin line coming from um, uh, coming from Turkey as well there. But oh no, sorry, not coming yeah. from Turkey, coming from uh, Cyprus actually. Yeah, um, but I, I I think I think the thing to sort of consider here is you know you've got a small supply chain. The rail networks aren't aren't particularly developed. In the first one, particularly, you get a sense that you know um, the low administrative demands, low risk factors, short supply chains. Sorts, you know, the, the, to administer this isn't a great trial. In the second one, in the 1880s, the transport transport allows a, a greater geographical scope to be touched. Uh, you know, it allows to encompass more trains can get across, you know, Europe pretty quickly, enables barriers to overcome the birds' natural processes. So when you start extending a supply chain with a live, um, live animal, you put the risk of death higher. But if you can reduce the speed, you know, uh, sorry, reduce the length of time and the speed uh, of delivery, that that risk, you know, you don't lose. 
uh, goods. And one of the interesting points is actually the birds were caught, sent to London, and then fattened. Um, really? So they were travelling live and then being fattened in London? Yeah, yeah I should say, this is all live transfer. This mm. is not... Um, this is not because uh, it keeps them fresh, right? You know, it keeps them fresh, but the also most fresh you can if, keep an animal is alive. Yeah, well, indeed. I mean, there was a case, and I need to pin this down that it's sometimes in the year quail were sent to Paris and fattened there because actually, once they got to London, they died in the atmosphere of London oh, in God. certain times of the year. I think that's to do with smog and you know whatever, but. Um, one of the things is, that, you know, the, the the virtue for the trader of fattening them at destination is that if they die in transit, they um, if they die in transit, they um, they don't lose their lose value you've invested in them. So if you fatten a bird in say the south of Europe and it dies, you spent lost all, all that, that money feed fattening. Cost. Yes, yeah, I see. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, the the thing is though, and, and another point to take in here is that the number of interfaces grows between the different things. So you need somebody to export. You need uh, probably the capturer. Uh, you need someone to export. So you need a shipping company to take it to Marseille. You need multiple railway companies across France. You need a boat company and a railway company. And on top of that, transport demands. You need a, a series of intermediaries to manage that trade. So whether that's um, the merchant, export merchant arranging with the railway companies or the shipping companies. So you, you increase the stresses in the supply chain. Um, you also perhaps need more legal uh, regulations and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I will talk a bit about that in a minute. But it, it creates more problems by lengthening the supply chain as much as the supply chain allows you to do more. It's Yeah, we've had a, a couple of interesting questions Um about um, any reflections between any commonality between this and modern supply chains, um, which perhaps is something we might touch on at the end. But um, yeah. yeah, it's certainly the case that I mean, I think that modern supply chains are very complicated and something that could be you know we could study and yeah. talk about in great detail. And actually, there have been some good suggestions in the chat of people who might I might get on to talk about modern supply chains and we can compare to this. But I think it's certainly something that you could say is that the trajectory very much is as supply chains get you know as as demand grows supply chains become more complex to satisfy that demand yeah i think this is a common theme you know you have greater transport demands greater informational demands m more interfaces and a lot of the supply chain literature that i've seen and I'm, i will stress that i'm a historian and i'm not a supply chain expert although i we will talk about a concept here um the governance of the supply chain is in the hands of lots of different people but there needs to be in this but there needs to be information flows across it but you know a lot of the supply chain literature that i've seen is about sort of reducing you know reducing the frictions yes which is uh, reducing the frictions in terms of dock costs of transit costs of speed of just in time logistics mm. reducing inventories um and actually in some sense this is what this is about you you need the same imperatives to imply uh, apply you need to, and we'll, we'll we'll get to a bit later how one particular organisation reduced, smoothed those things out in a way that was, I think, possibly quite unique for the era. So yeah. yeah. So and this is all relevant to contemporary <laughs> stuff that I didn't put in the news, but um yeah, it's all all this stuff is relevant. All this history of trade and the friction about trade and the transfer yeah. of goods is all particularly relevant. Uh, Ella, I mean, I mean a lot of the supply chain literature, like a lot of sort of, you know, so literature dealing with contemporary issues, likes to think what it's doing is new. <laughs> yeah. um, these, these issues are, are as old as... It kind of feels like the current discussions that are happening related to um, trade between let's say the various parts of the European archipelago, let's let's call that the youth. Well, indeed, yes. Um, are not dissimilar to the very same discussions that were happening between the various constituent parts of the European archipelago um, through the 1800s. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> development of trading relationships. Uh, Ella, Ella, the developer, in the chat, um, points out that you can probably stuff more quail into a train car when they aren't as fat. Uh, that's probably yeah. also relevant. <laughs> that, 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 that's absolutely the... the the, the, a, a true point but i mean a quail is about this big 
they are not big birds. Um, so I, I do wonder how many you can get in a train car. But yeah. yeah. Probably a frightening number that we don't really want to think about to the point where, uh, yeah, if we, if, well, you know, I was thinking about putting a picture in, but I thought actually I'd need to put a content warning well, in and is... I'd invariably forget that which slide it is and it would be a problem. Well, echoes of, of debates, and again, I think we might get to echoes of debates in recent years about the transit of live animals um, were going on about quail. Mm. Depending on who you asked, uh, they would tell you how um, many what percentage died and they would all be different so some some accounts say 40 percent of birds in transit died the 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 importers said about five percent i would suggest it's probably somewhere in between mm. yeah 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 so um i brought your lovely face in there so everyone can be reminded of what we look like respectively my mustache is looking really scrappy um we have a picture here of yeah uh what was presumably not a new building, but it's a building. It's this is a uh, a postcard, I think, or or a kind of a print from the late eighteen hundreds um, of a yeah. barracks in Egypt. I think it was a barracks uh, along the Nile uh, near Cairo, actually. So, yeah, um, Egypt and so the is reason, yeah, the reason I put this up is because because Britain went in and and or actually, so in the lead up to right, so so eighteen eighty, what is it, eighteen eighty two. Is that right? Yeah. Britain invades uh, Egypt and yeah. takes it's it's complex, but it's part of the Ottoman Empire and it remains part of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Empire but occupied. I think I've got that until right. Until 1914, yeah. So until um, until yeah, the the the, the late because because basically everyone declared war on the Ottoman Empire. So uh, yeah, maybe. But so I essentially, think I, yeah. So so 1882 was because. I think the country had just been it had been investing lots of yeah. foreign capital on the basis that the country would grow, uh, you know, huge infrastructure, civil engineering projects, the, the canal, you know, the Suez Canal is one, the dams, all these investments that subsequently didn't create the return that these financial investors, i.e., you know, European investors, mm -hmm. imperial investors, had expected, and so they um, they bailed out the they bailed the country out on the basis that they could then occupy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, and I think France and Britain it. collectively yeah. invaded. I think it was like a joint effort. I believe. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, again, this is an error I need to look into in a bit more depth. But one of the things you do get after the invasion is a, is a sort of growth in um, investment, still continuing a trend from before, um, and it and it sort of sets it up for a new phase of the quail trade, um, and. Yeah, so if we can go on to yeah, the, so if we whip us, yeah. whip on to the next, I've got we've got a couple of quotes from the console. Oh um, yes, yeah. So you got the first yeah, one. Shall is, I read these out? Wait a minute. Yeah. yeah so this is from the console, which means I suppose it's some sort of. Um, I'm going to insult huge numbers of people now. It's some probably guffawing inbred person who's super rich and and like thirteenth or fifteenth from in line to the throne or something. Uh, but in fairness, this is they're moaning about bird uh, cruelty. So here we go. This trade is one which does not commend itself to any true sportsman or lover of birds. It is slowly but surely reducing the number of quails which annually visit Egypt and is the cause of many acts of cruelty to these birds. That's, that's 1899. That was, that was me doing a voice. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so that was in 1899. And then in 1904, they're almost getting more vigorous in their uh, complaint. Let's assume it's the same chap. The proposal to afford some protection to insectivorous birds is one which should evoke the sympathy of all who are interested in agriculture in this country. There can be no doubt that their destruction has been hurtful to agricultural interests. So, I'm, yeah, I mean, there are two interesting reports. So the first thing I'll say, actually, there is a report, I think, in the 1890s from the French um, the French in North Africa uh, along the coast, I think in Tunisia, and it basically says that there's a famine in Tunisia. Um, and one of the reasons, it's, well, it's a locust plague, destroys the crops. Part of the reason or part of the suggestion is that one of the reasons is that the declining number of quail that would ordinarily eat the locusts had had an impact on that. And this is no doubt what the 1904 report is discussing you know the, the it's hurtful to agriculture because these birds are insectivorous they are eating the insects that mm. preserve the crops so you've got 
a length, a length, you know, a sort of a, a trade here that is consuming thousands, millions of birds each year. 1897, as we say, two million are exported from Egypt. That is impacting on local, mm. um, local traders and, and local people to the point in some places that you know the we've got hunger. And, yeah. we've got hunger yeah. Yeah, yeah and again this 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 has modern resonances about the idea of how what happens at one end of the supply chain mm. can have severe and horrendous effects at the other one that people can have their entire lives well people can die and have their entire lives disrupted by a trade and i think one of the things that we we try and sort of think about these days is well, where do our goods come from? Who's you know who who's exploited or who's been harmed because of the sort of Western world's demand for goods? But these concerns are. This is a good example of actually these concerns in, are, are very very old. Um, it's it's particularly so interesting. That, that, that 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 last quote is particularly interesting, and the the kind of the, the poignance of that because that's basically what my dad's job is is looking at. Um, so not supply chains, but. Um, ecological food chains and so the consequences yeah. of from you know he looks at land use but to understand land use ecology you have to understand the the processes of bird life and he's done a lot of bird-based studies mm. um he's a bit of a bird brain but also he's an entomologist so he looks at the insects and because the reality is that insects have a huge influence on agriculture and on you know they're both pollinators but they're also pests so yeah it's interesting that that's i mean it's fascinating for my you know it's interesting seeing that sort of understanding of, e of land use ecology yeah. being discussed in 1904. So, uh, yeah, it might be one I'll bring up with um, Eco Pete. Uh, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. It's particularly interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, so the so the reaction to this is in Europe. Um, there is a international congress, as I said. There's a lot of concern, and and it it, it stems from a defence of local hunters. In a lot, in like France. Yeah. I, I, I'm not. I need to pin down the details on this, but France um, bans the movement of live quail across its territory. Other countries do too. They actually form a pact with Germany, if you can believe it, at this time to stop the movement of live quail. I'm not sure how far that broke down. I think it broke down by the by the First World War. Um, but there are moves in Europe to protect quail stocks, and to some degree, the British. Uh, there's a, another consular report. So what happens in Egypt is that they ban the capture of quails along the coastline and in certain areas around the coast. And those are the Egyptian authorities. I don't, I don't think it's the sort of central government in uh, central authority in, in London, but it, 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 it changes the supply chain again. Um, but the uh, sort of sense is that, you know, there is a huge problem here, and the, but the British government, there is a report from I think about 1913, just kind of ignore the problem, saying, "Well, there's plenty in Egypt. We don't have to act. There's plenty in Egypt. Why the Europeans might want to act on their own accord, but there's plenty in Egypt." Mm. So this goes to the is is the map the next one, Gareth? It. it... Is oh no, it's not. There's a quail. Hey. So we just talked about quail abuse. So I thought I'd put a quail in. This, this happy looking. I don't don't know how happy looking it is. It doesn't seem. It, it seems pretty severely pissed off actually looking at it. There, but anyway, well, they have that look sometimes. Yeah, they do a bit. Yeah, ugly little buggers. Right. Uh, <laughs> we love so quails. What, Here's a map. What you get is uh, restrictions across Europe about movement of live quail. Again, these ah. these are fragments. But so mobility, we've lost this. There's a glaring yeah. gap. Switzerland banned it and Germany banned it. Hmm. Now I don't I don't know how long that lasted, but what that does is that realigns the supply chain again. So you've got this supply chain. So the supply chain as it's described in 1913 is that quail are captured at by the locals in the Nile Valley and Delta. They are delivered to trading stations that are then forwarded into the Egyptian state railways. And I need to there's a part of me that quite clearly needs to get to Egypt to look at the files of the Egyptian State Railway to see what what they were relation. Then uh, what they were involved, or sort of what, how much, but they were these trading stations, and then they were forwarded to Alexandra, where they went to a warehouse. Then a ship of the Prince Line um, moved them all the way to the Manchester Ship Canal. The Manchester ship, the Prince Prince line. So one of the things that also happens 
um, in this period is that there are more routes to the eastern Mediterranean by shipping lines. The Prince Line develops its routes to Egypt. They are moved to the Manchester Ship Canal. They are then um, moved down by the Great Northern Railway from Manchester into King's Cross, and that goes back to the first picture I showed, uh, where they are unloaded um, at King's Cross and put into a warehouse of fattening. Now, the special arrangements, there were attendants. So what you do is you extend the supply chain, you increase the risk factors via distance. So there are attendants with the birds all the way from um, Alexandria down to London. There are special coops sort of made up so that they're kept level. There is also speedy ships. Uh, the train that the Great Northern Railway in Britain puts on is an express train that is getting special clearance because this only happens like a few times a year. So it's not like all, all the while. It's not like, you know, I don't know how many times it happens, but it, it, those, those periods of, you know, demand, peak demand. Um, express trains are, are, are special trains that are specially fitted up. So you've got an entire system there that is geared specially to this trade to reduce the risk factors and increase the speed. Mm. And one of the things that does happen, and I'm not entirely sure, is you get the emergence of something called, something called the Egyptian Quail Syndicate. The, the Quail Syndicate? So all the puns in the chat, you've, you've, that's it. The literal Egyptian Quail Syndicate exists. Yeah. So this is a, an Egyptian-based company um, created by, I'm not entirely sure, I think it's like, British expats living in Egypt. And what they do is, as I mentioned, as you increase, you uh, increase the break, you know, the, the points at which there's frictions and break points, both administrative and transport. But the syndicate has arrangements with the Egyptian state railways. It has arrangements with um, Prince Line. It owns or hires at least the warehousing in London and in um and in Alexandra, it has a special arrangement with the Great Northern Railway for that train. And it also, once the birds have been fattened, redistributes the birds throughout um, Britain. Um, London is still one of the major markets, but it has a complete dominance. And the report from the government in 1911, 12, 13, I can't remember off the top of my head, says that this company has dominated the trade. So basically, where previously you had lots of different traders, it's need to overcome all those has basically all the problems of a length length supply chain has pushed out everybody else yeah so you, you, you've, had, you've ended up with this massive monopolization of the, of yeah. the supply chain it's interesting yeah indeed and I, I think one of the things we're talking about governance is actually its governance allows it to do that because it takes up a quite unique place in the supply chain because it's a dominant place it it it, it can it can corner the market and actually i've looked at quail prices it's very laborious and there is a, a magazine in the british library called the it's something like the the the, the game and fish trades gazette great reading for <laughs> game and fish trades enthusiasts but it lists the prices at london markets and what happens is i see a steady decline as the the syndicate so the syndicate actually started around the time that the the um it was three businesses that came together to form this syndicate. And we don't, it's like, it's it's as mythical and as hard to find out about as its name suggests. Uh, yeah. Not mythical, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it sounds almost but like cult-like or uh, like some yeah. sort of conspiracy theory, yeah. But it, it starts about 1882, so I think just around the time of the invasion. Um, and as its prominence grows, it actually, you can see the prices rise up and then decline it gluts the market. So by 1913, I think the, the, the consular report says, actually, not the consular report, the, the British government report says, um, well, now they're restricting supply to keep prices high. So they have got this market t completely tied up. So that's that's what happens. So it's... so. We've had a few interesting questions, actually, and, and, and apologies if you sort of touched on it, but it's an interesting observation. So uh, both from Matt Reed and from Ella Developer, uh, Matt was asking why does it why did they ship them into Liverpool rather than into uh, into London directly? 
Uh, and L asked a similar question, but asked why they didn't ship them into um, into Bristol and then uh, send them up the GWR. Now, is it about yeah. rates or is it about harbour availability? What, 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 what do you one, reckon? Yeah, I mean, one of the... So there's a great uh, comment, a uh, paper by MC, um, PJ Kane, who's an economic historian, um, and he, he looks at sort of rates and transit and stuff like that in Britain. I think the thing about Britain is you can't see it as like directness and how, because the railway companies would uh, compete for the best, uh, they, uh, they would compete for the traffic. So your company looking for a grain traffic from, from you know, coming in from the United States and, and a vast amount. So Britain is importing huge volumes by the end of the 19th century mm. of goods. Um, like for a good example, one third of hops used in British beer in the late Victorian period comes from the United States, Austria, wherever. Most, I, I couldn't, couldn't tell you about the actual proportion, but most British food comes in from overseas by the end of the Victorian or Edwardian period or a, a very high proportion. Mm. But you can't see Britain as, you know, sort of a supply, the end of the supply chain where the closest route will work because the two railway companies say uh, the Great Eastern might compete uh, with the Great Northern or the Northwestern for the traffic coming in from the United States. The London docks was also competing against different docks, which were frequently owned. So it, it, I think it's distance is not a factor here. The other thing about Bristol um, is uh, Bristol's not particularly a major harbour, uh, sorry, port at this point. Liverpool, Southampton and London are the main ones. Um, Liverpool, uh, of course, has got the long historic um, develop, you know. So in the the 18th century, uh, of course, two major ports involved in the slave economy. Mm. Um, Liverpool overtakes um, Bristol uh, in the mid 19th, 18th century, and Liverpool becomes this major port. Portsmouth is developed by the London South Western Railway. Uh, London, the port of London itself, is a massive port again involved in the slave economy from the 18th century, but. Um, but also uh, a huge mixture of other bits and pieces. As yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know, so um, I think I think you know, and there are other ports around the nation, but these were the main ones. And the Manchester Ship Canal was was built to take traffic off uh, railways and mm. you know various things. So it's it's another player in the transport. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to think of canals competing successfully with the railways, but the Manchester Ship Canal certainly did, because it got rid yeah. of an interchange, right? Yeah, yeah. And the Prince Line ships, the Prince Line ships went right up into the canal. There was a special sort of unloading for the quail. So I hope that answers uh, the uh, question. Matt and yeah, that, good, good questions, folks. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. The chat's gone absolutely crazy because I, often it does. People are talking about all sorts of things. Um, let's not talk too much about Discord because there'll be a lot of people want, hoping to ask questions. So, um, yeah, uh, thanks, everyone. Right, uh, next slide is i'm conscious of time as well we've blitzed it it's 10 past oh yeah, yeah whoops so so there you have a prince line ship i've actually you know it's it's there's there's no history of the prince line i went to look at the files in the national maritime museum and they didn't say much about they didn't say anything of use unfortunately brilliant archive lovely archive but mm. the files just weren't revealing you can see here this uh, is the something that's the something i can't read prince so you can see prince yeah in the, in the I ship's think... name they were all something prints. Something. Yeah, yeah. The one on the left is cheating a little bit because that's actually slightly post-war. But that is a... <laughs> really? a yeah, that's a, a camel that uh, was captured quails in, in the baskets and being taken to a collecting point. Mm. So this is in Egypt? That's in Egypt, yes. In Egypt, yeah. So in Egypt, camel with baskets. There's this chap uh, who's who's looking a bit bemused he's having to photo taking because he's just trying to get on with his day job. Um, yeah. And then, uh, and then this rather, this rather stout-looking vessel, actually. This one, um, sort yeah. of, a, you know, a, a kind of a mid-sized merchant vessel. You know, it's ocean-going, but it's not, you know, it's not a huge tanker-sized thing. But it's a pretty hefty yeah. for the era. Probably a pretty hefty. Um, I mean, I did, vessel. I did read a complaint from 1904 that a Prince Line ship. So they they took passengers as well. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And uh, they ate a lot of quail on the journey, um, and this person was complaining that, that on the ships there was a, a sort of foul smell of, of uh, quail detritus 
So. Not really. <laughs> yeah. So um. So the next image is a is is more railway themed. This is a yeah. real matter after all. Quails being unloaded in coops uh, in in coops on the yeah. train. Yeah. Um, a few heads, and... little quail heads here. Yeah, you can see them. Yeah, a few quail heads. They are a quail head. Um, and and this here, G N, I presume is is would there be an so R here? This, this is, is the King's Cross unloading depot. Mm -hmm. Um, the goods depot just just outside and then they would be moved by these people were specially prepared for this traffic to come in because it was time sensitive mm. um it's a case of good customer service on the part of the railway arguably um and yeah um i'm circling all I, the little quails out in spot i don't know yeah why. you I can see their little heads yeah little heads poking out these chaps presumably the supervisor here with his bowler supervisor foreman yeah i think uh, they'll just be sort of porters or yeah yeah these chaps are their porters yeah so um yeah they're getting busy with moving them. i mean presumably there would have been a veritable sort of regiment of people yeah for the volume of of live quails arriving to then I mean, where where were they fattened up? Were they fattened up in warehouses in in warehouses the city? Warehouses at King's Cross. So they oh, literally. It was actually at King's Cross. Crikey. Yeah. Crikey. That's so the so again, it's yeah. that specialist arrangements for it. Yeah, that's. I mean, that doesn't bear thinking about really. What's what, what was going on? What the conditions would have been like in those warehouses? Mm. Um, and to remind us of what the conditions. Were, here's a, here's a quail. Just so I think that's a, that's not a European quail. It isn't. No, it's one of the other. Uh, it's one of the other uh, part kind of part of the family. Um, yeah, I just I think the quails are eaten. You know, and, and and you know, there's there's different species in, in North America and Southeast Asia, and and you know, there's different species. So uh, they it's are worth pointing out for the for the pedants who quite... come into the chat and tell us this isn't the common quail. We're, we're just acknowledging that fact now. Mm. <laughs> I I. I they're, they're, they're precious little birds. They've got nice characters, so apparently. Yeah, well, well tempered birds. So um, the next image kind of leads us towards the conclusion. Well, in fact, it's part of the conclusion of, of, mm. of sort of your, your investigations into this, into this trade, into this sort of fairly sizable aspect of railway history. Um, yeah, so this is really the the kind of the overriding theme that you've found right as a as a as you investigate supply chains more broadly and and also yeah. focusing on the quail what did you say this was gareth it's so this is yeah so this is this is a satellite view of um agriculture in uh, i think it might be kentucky I have to yeah. be corrected on that john christoph in the chat where is he i suppose um, my point is with this is that the supply chain is essentially trying to control nature by the, you know, really by the end. Nature intersects with human life because one of the things that I brought home there's a there's a uh, a book by forgive me I've forgotten his first name Cronin called Nature uh, Nature's Metropolis, and he makes the point that the 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 natural landscape, the natural farming landscape is unnatural. Mm. We might like to present. Um, spaces of sort of green and pleasant land in britain as, as oh the natural environment but actually farming is not natural the farming environment is is as industrialized as a as a factory in many places mm. and nature we are nature will appear and influence how we try and try and control food supplies and you know and with the quail nature is at its core because we got the migratory patterns we have the um we have the, the declining numbers then we have the necessary so sort of, well we have the necessary we have the attempts to try and control the bird's health um and you know actually as i said i said to you earlier uh, there's concern over the quail and, and the syndicate actually uh, get people from the royal society it's, it's an early version it's an early iteration of the rspca to look at the birds and make sure they're in health mm. um Again, that's that's addressing a natural concern. So when it comes to food supply chains, nature actually is at the heart of it, mm. and it's our attempts to control. Yeah. So just to, just to for, to audio describe this image because it is quite a vivid, striking image for those who can't who don't have the privilege of you know, the pleasure of seeing it. Um, this is it looks like lots of green CDs all laid out. The reason that they're like this is because of the the fact that they all have um, kind of. Uh, water sprays in a big on a kind of on a wheel 
uh, rotating around mm. kind of like a like a record player arm spreading water on them so they can irrigate these um and it's just huge i mean it's you know these fields will be massive and there are count hundreds of them hundreds of them kind of half and double size all these vivid greens with brown in between and you can see some of the fields that have been abandoned it's just quite a striking image it really is um really quite something so that is that yeah but then there are other conclusions you, you, you found right that are perhaps less about the, the 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 impact often negative on the environment yeah but other other sort of more more human and technical um so as a sort of discrete try supply chain we, we can make a few points you know consistent and growing market demand uh requires supply you know and people will try and supply it um it's it's capitalistic forces at work in, you know in a way it's it's well not in a way but it's it's the need to supply the demand took precedence over anything else yeah 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 then declining populations meant that satisfying the supply ch the demand in London meant lengthening the supply chain. Not London, Britain, sorry, lengthening the supply chain. But this essentially caused administrative and transport arrangers, arrangements to be put in place to overcome the bird's natural life cycle, the limitations on the goods. Um, Natural uh, national governments also played their role, influencing supply chains and their development. And finally, you know, global supply chains have uh, are his are have historically had uh, detrimental in social, economic, and environmental impacts. So I think you know, there's a there's a a lot we can unpack there. There's a lot that looks familiar to the modern supply chain issues. And Gareth, I think we have one final. There is a, yeah, there is a final key conclusion, which is which is actually which you which which you uncovered as part of your research, I believe. Yeah, no, this was a really um, yeah really key, uh, which which is of course that um, the uh, quill is also tasty. Quill is tasty. It's, it's yeah. tasty. Yeah, it's, it's tasty. I've had it a couple of times. I actually had it in Sicily. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it was very tasty, uh, and that's a recipe you can do. Uh, quail is. Usually, I got it from Borough Market, but you wrap it in bacon, you put some roast potatoes, and you, well, you roast it, and you put some roast potatoes with it, some veg, and have a nice beer, and it's, uh, it's delicious. Yeah, yeah. It's typical, yeah. It's yeah, typical good. So it, it is. Yeah, I, I, I have, I've, I've not consciously had quail, but I have to have to look it up because um, all yeah. this discussion of quails has made me feel hungry. Um, yeah, and, and a good yeah. a good addendum to this actually is that the the, the quail trade was banned. Um, in in 1930s because of declining numbers, um, and the Bermondsey uh, police thing. Um, oh yeah, the Bermondsey police. The, uh, I think it was the RSPCA or again another iteration previously, is that they wrote to the Bermondsey uh, police asking them to go along to Hayes Galleria, Hayes, you know, what well, is now oh, yeah. Hayes Galleria, yeah, Hayes yeah. Dock, to go and see if people were importing them illegally. And were they? Uh, I don't know. The, the Metropolitan Police report didn't say. I think that but the average it, it weight said of the Bermondsey police them. went up by several pounds after that period. You know, they <laughs> but the, quail, the, yeah. quails on the side. We're not <laughs> anyone who's a descendant of Bermondsey police. That was uh, 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 meant in jest. Uh, I'm sure you were not. I'm sure they weren't all bent coppers. Yeah. Uh, full yeah of the other interesting sort of thing is that actually quail capture numbers go di up directly after the first world war but and i might need to go back to the sources because i don't actually work in this period but um they were banned the trade was banned in it italy and the reason was uh during the, the wars the reason was because mussolini was a bird lover and he heard about it and he put a stop to it oh really Oh, but you get these very fawning articles in the 1930s of one particular article I'm thinking of and said, ah, it shows how effective a dictatorship can be in solving problems. And you're oh, just going, dear. Ah. Oh, dear. Um, yeah, so that kind of leads in. So so the I think Matt, was it Matt, Matthew, is it yourself uh, who asked this question? I'm going to trace up. Trace up, trace up. I can't find the question, Matt. But if it was Matt or not, but the question was: um, So how do quail? How do we have quails now? How does that? How does that work? Where do they come from? 
So, um, oh, I also said they tried freezing them after the First World War. Oh, really? um, freezing pot. Uh, quails today are probably you're going to be if you if you get them from a, a butcher's, uh, you're going to be eating farmed American quail. Um, the ones, although the ones I the, the ones in the picture came from France, actually, that's just an import. Um, but yeah, that that if you eat them today, that's where you're getting them from. They're they're, they're, they're now farmed. And I don't know what's changed. Maybe that maybe it's just that the, the American quail is a hardier variety, and there were some minor imports, but uh, of that. But yeah, uh, I presume the whole lot is in, the whole supply chain is entirely industrialized at that point. So you don't. It's not that you're impacting on a natural. You're in, in influencing a natural food chain at that point. It's just that, yeah. the, that you're, you're creating creatures simply to to eat them. Um, John Christoph points out that um, quail is indeed tasty. So people agreeing with that. Some discussion about the chlorination levels of imported quail. Let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that, that is the, the quail. I think it's um, I think it's a really... In- I mean, there's all sorts of interesting stuff there about supply chains, and actually there's a huge amount of that, that you can learn about s- supply chains more broadly from looking at this period and this particular product. I think it's great. Um, is, is, are you doing any? Oh well, let's get your face back. Let's let's bring let's bring David back alongside me. There we go. That's nice. Um, are you do, Has any additional stuff come off this? Or are you, st- are you st- is it still an active project? Or have you kind of drawn a bow under it? What where is it? At? So I've got I've got a sort of uh, speculative piece with my as I said with my colleague Thomas Spain who works on 20th century supply chains in food supply chains in Britain. We're going to we're, it's a sort of theoretical piece, sort of talking about governance and and actually governance is important to look at in supply mm-hmm. chains, in a historical sense and it can open up all these questions about regulation and, and environment and stuff like that and it's a good way to, to go. You know, it is an active project but it, it's not a it's one I come back to when I find when I have a sort when of you hour spot something. Yeah, yeah, it's not a main project for me. It's a, it's a sort of hobby project. Um, uh, but it, it, it's not urgent because it's not it's not urgent in my life at the moment. I've got other things I've got to work on, and no doubt, you know, I'll come on and talk about those at some point. Mm. Um, but you know, it, it's just something. It's well, it's just interesting, if isn't it? It, it comes. It will hopefully turn into a journal article, whether that takes one, two, or three, ten years. But, it, but the, it's, the, biddy. it's It's so biddy to find evidence. Yeah. You know, it's, trawling newspapers it's the odd reference in an archive it's not like having a, a railway company archive yeah where you've got you can just hundred files you yeah. know it's, it's it's difficult yeah 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 so so um yeah so i it, that, i mean we've run it what time is it it's not too bad an hour 22 i mean we've done worse i think david i think we've we've done worse before yeah. but um yeah. <laughs> no that was um well, tell you what, let's hammer through the before we let's let's hammer through the the end the the, the kind of the, the, the closing remarks before we um bring each other back for our final thing. So, um, in terms of podcasts, we we're available. Rail Natter is now available on all good podcasting platforms, uh, and we're soon going to be on another one as well. Actually, probably by next week, um, as you might have noticed, in, if you follow podcasting news, which I certainly do not, I have people who do that for me, uh, who are in the chat right now, um. Uh, oh, lots. Yeah. So ask your que- while I'm doing this bit, ask your questions, and then we'll come to questions at the end, everyone. So type your questions in while I do the blurb. So uh, yeah, all your favourite things. So to everyone who's following in this in audio only, I can only apologise. Hopefully it was interesting. Uh, hopefully there were suitable sound effects and beer noises and quail uh, chirps and so on. Um, Patreon, yes. Uh, support me on Patreon if you if you wish to. Um, all I can say is that you get to choose things and be one of my producers. So there is a Discord channel now with people. Uh, we're asking or providing me with much advice and recommendations so thanks to all those people on here now um also you get sneaky peeks uh, and also you get asked inane questions by me uh so uh if that's what you're into then uh, so be it um and that's yeah also that leads on to the fact there is a discord channel david i have no idea what a discord channel is but but the, or discord server sorry but it exists and there are 200 people on it 200 people nice. just chatting away about rail matter on a server with like multiple channels and all different conversations happening, it's a plethora of railway chat. It's quite fun actually. Mm-hmm. It's nice. It's like the chat in this, but it just continues all all week round. Um, mm-hmm. People are asking quails on rails. What about whale by rail? Well, that's for another episode, clearly. Um, uh, and and if you don't fancy Patreon, then uh, chuck 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 me a penny or two on PayPal. That's always welcome. Um, oh, next week, yes, a hundred ways for railway rails to fail. 
we've had quails on rails. Now we've got rails and fails. Uh, it's, it, I don't know what the, I don't know what episode thirty is going to be to continue the punnery, but uh, we'll see. So um, if you're interested in how actual massive girders of rail that, of metal that support trains can disintegrate, this is the episode for you. I'm going to hammer through as many of them as I possibly can and describe uh, how they occur and how we can fix them. So that that might be that that could mm-hmm. be interesting. Could be interesting. Um, so join us for that. That should be uh, yeah. It should be. I'm looking forward to that because it'll be uh, it'll be a chance for yeah. some hard hard bashing uh, rail p- permanent way chat, which I haven't done for a while. I've been kind of trying to broaden it out uh, out of my comfort zone. But yeah, we're going to very much return to my comfort zone for that one. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I've just realised I've not updated the Patreon supporters uh, list, so there might be one or two people who've appeared since. Apologies to those people. I'll, I'll give you a shout out. Anyway. Um, Dr. David Turner, thanks so much for that. Let's have a look no at these worries. questions, shall we? Just in the last thing. Uh, there we go. Uh, I, think I, I think I saw one about how, how do you do a railway studies course. Well, ah, yes. Um, I might have missed it, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, you email or you go you search on Google, railway studies, um, University of York. Uh, it's a full MA, and, uh, you know, all the details are there. So... And lots of there are lots of people on Twitter who heartily recommend it. There are loads of people who've done it and love yeah. it, and and it's it's great. I haven't, um, that's sort of because I, I've never quite found the time. But actually, I, I, I maybe I ought to at some point. I, you yeah, don't I'll count be, as a real railway person if you don't do. We really. we got a real community going there amongst the students, and we got forty plus students at any one time. So it's a, a, a sizable chunk, isn't it? It's a, yeah. it's a it's a hefty chunk. Um, so uh, Hoyerman points out uh, that they've seen fascinating accounts of the transport of live fish to London by train in specially designed trolleys that use the movement of the train to oxygenate that water for the fish. That's, 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 that's interesting. That's fascinating. Uh, that's a new one on me. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. Um, uh, there we go, yeah. So Pete Johnson's pointing out you can you, flowers from Scilly or crayfish from Malig. Yeah, that's it. I was going to hit langoustine from uh, the northwest of Scotland, which I was had some of over the weekend, actually, because I was in Oban. Langoustine, lovely. Pretty much all the langoustine in Europe come from Scotland, actually. Um, uh, let's see, any other questions? Uh, oh, yeah, Ella was asking about the requirements need for, for rail studies. Uh, yep, so that... Well, in terms of requirements, we, we do usually sort of ask for an undergraduate degree in a related field, um, but we are committed to open access. It's the Centre for Lifelong Learning that runs it. Mm. So we look at people's backgrounds. We realise people come back to education after a long time. So we look at people's backgrounds, work careers, um, you know, experiences. Um, and, you know, we have people, we might ask people to complete a, a, an essay as a sort of, you know, just to make sure, you know, for the reasons I'm sure people can understand yeah, yeah. If, if you don't have that first degree. But as I say, it's just a matter of keep, you know, asking and, and, and get in touch and, you know, don't, if you, if you don't have a first degree in a related field, um, we, there are ways in, let's just say there are yeah. ways to get onto the course. So, um, we've, we've got a lot of people interested at the, at the weird and wacky agricultural products transported by rail. So David Shepherd is talking about the fact the Metropolitan Line had special train carriages to stop milk getting churned into butter. That's quite interesting. Uh, Jeremy yeah. Zorick is making a reference that I spotted in a Well There's Your Problem podcast recently, which is where um, uh, the South Brooklyn Railway tried to transport a dead whale from the harbour to Coney Island, uh, and it did not fit through one of the tunnels. Right, okay. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, Coney Island is famously an island, so you'd expect, you know, why didn't they just put it on a barge and get it to <laughs> Coney Island in barge? But there we go. That's, uh, that's Justin Rosniak's shtick, so uh, I'm not going to say any more on that. Anyway, yeah, David, that's been brilliant. I'm not going to take up any more of your time, and I'm conscious that we're Sorry, approaching I'm, the hour yeah. and a half mark. Uh, everyone, thanks so much for joining. And, um, yeah, David, that, that was that was great. I had such a nice... It was, it was lovely yeah, well, I, yeah. I hope everybody sort of learned something. It is a subject that I just thought to myself... Sorry, I'm looking at the um, feed a bit here. But it's a yeah. subject to my... I thought to myself, people don't know about it, but everybody comes away a bit surprised. Yeah, it's 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 a deeply interesting little little nugget of um, yeah, it's great. And and as you say, it intersects lots of real history, lots of like other history kind of disciplines all intersect in this. Yeah, and and thank you for inviting me on, Gareth, because you know I think I think everybody should applaud the fact you're on episode twenty eight and how this is a great thing. Oh, well, I don't know how it survived this long. I didn't think the format well, had this many legs to sustain it. 
but uh, it's still building, going. Building a community is an achievement, and it's such a wonderful thing you're doing here, Gareth. So I think you know you should be proud of yourself. So it's it's the people who watch and the people who come on as guests who make this show what it is. So um, thanks to all of what all the viewers out there. You're brilliant. Thanks to Patreon supporters. And uh, and thanks to the regular guests of the, on the show, particularly Dr. David Turner, who's who's this is your third appearance, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not your last either. There's so much more. Uh, oh, people are really eager for you to get into the Discord, but I, I, I'm going to let you make that. Uh, that's David is an incredibly busy person, and the Discord is a is, go and is eat scary. Right? Yeah. Not also, right. I need to go. And, so people are asking me. I haven't had my dinner yet, so I also need to do that. Anyway, right. Enough of this chat. This is this is for all the people who are listening to this in podcast form on their commute. Uh, they're just like, I don't care about your dinner. I just want to. It's finished now. Stop talking. Well, okay, we will stop talking. I, I've been. That's been Doctor David. That's been Doctor David Turner, and uh, wow. there is. And I've been. We should have. We should have rehearsed this, David. And, I, and I've been Gareth Dennis. And this has been Rail Matter. Thank you so much, everyone. Cheerio. Bye, everybody. Cheerio.